Want to make a podcast? Spotify's got a platform that lets you make one super easily, then distribute it everywhere, and even earn money, all in one place for free. It's called Spotify for Podcasters, and here's how it works. Spotify for Podcasters lets you record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer, so no matter what your setup is like, you can start creating today. Then, you can distribute your podcast to Spotify and everywhere else podcasts are heard. Video podcasts are also available on Spotify. With Spotify for Podcasters, you can earn money in a variety of ways, including ads and podcast subscriptions. And best of all, it's totally free with no catch. Ever since I discovered Spotify for Podcasters, I feel like I've been having a lot more connection with my listeners through the Q&As and polls. I highly recommend you give it a try. Download the Spotify for Podcasters app or go to www.spotify.com forward slash podcasters to get started. Hi, I'm Father Daniel DePlantis, a Catholic priest, martial artist, and host of the Karate Priest Podcast. Have you ever wondered what the Church teaches about different topics? Are you a martial arts enthusiast or just someone who wants to learn more about martial arts? I'd like to invite you to join me and many guests on my podcast as we cover topics of faith, everyday living, and martial arts on the Karate Priest Podcast. everybody. Welcome back to the Religious Hippie Podcast, the podcast about being a young Catholic surviving in a secular world. Today is a very special guest we have on with us. This is Father Looney. Hi, Father Looney. Hello, Amber. Great to be with you. Thank you so much for being with us. And today's topic is very exciting. We're basically going to be talking about the importance of what we listen to and what we read and watch, why that's important to us, and how we should filter out certain things because especially in today's secular society i think a lot of things get kind of pushed in our face and whether we have a choice in it or not we have to really guard our heart so without further ado though uh father looney do you want to kind of give some background to the listeners about yourself sure i'm happy to do so uh, i'm a, a priest of the diocese of green bay wisconsin so if uh your listeners are fans of marian apparitions They might know that Champion, Wisconsin is a place where Mary appeared in 1859. Uh, I'm one of the experts, I guess you could say, on the apparition. I've done a lot of writing and reflecting about the significance and meaning of the apparition, which really led me into kind of this role as a Marian theologian. And uh, currently, I serve as the president of the Mariological Society of America, which is kind of a fancy organization of about 300 theologians and scholars from all over the world. And uh, typically we meet once a year and uh, discuss Mary and talk about her and uh, different attributes and aspects of the discipline of studying Mary. So uh, that's kind of a a neat little thing that uh, really the apparition kind of launched me into. Uh, I've done a lot of other study on Mary beside apparitions, but that is something I'm very interested in. If people follow me on social media, they probably know I love to uh, travel. So I I do a lot of little travel videos from different shrines that I visit, because I know a lot of people can't get there. And so if I'm able to be there, I want to share the experience with other people. Uh, I also podcast. So uh, I have a podcast, uh, How They Love Mary. It's an interview podcast where a lot of times we talk about Mary, but sometimes we talk about other uh, Catholic interest topics as well. So, and, and finally, just an author as well. So lots of different books I've written about Mary. And uh, I'm proud to say that I did write one book, not about Mary directly, and that was on uh, Holy Communion and Meditations After Holy Communion. So uh, I guess that's just a little bit about me. That's awesome. Yeah, I know you sent me your book, um, How They Love Mary, I believe is what it's called. And that was a fantastic book. I absolutely loved it. Actually, something that I didn't know is when I first came back into my faith, I actually bought your Eucharistic Meditations book before I even knew who you were. So that is to me like greatly in my prayer life. And I had no idea until I saw the book on your website um, a couple days ago. And I was like, I have that book. I've been reading that book. For some reason, I never thought to look at the author, but that's fantastic. Wow, that's amazing. And, you know, that is a book, Meditations After Holy Communion, that just came out, I think, maybe in 2021. So that means your reversion kind of happened just recently. 
And uh, that yeah. was really inspired by a, a priest named Father Daniel Lord. And I wrote on his Marian Eucharistic theology. So that was kind of what led me to uh, want to do something like that. But Father Lord lived back in the first part of the 1900s. He would go to these different convents and he would preach uh, to the nuns. He'd say mass. And afterwards, he would lead them in this meditative uh, reflection. And so that's what I kind of wanted to do was to bring back uh, kind of that idea of meditating after mass. And, you know, people don't know how to do that. So how do you pray? How do you meditate? So just little prompts then to help them to do that. So that's, that's amazing that you uh, found that book yourself. No, it's fantastic. And it's helped me a lot. I definitely bought it back in 2020. Like um, it was either the summer or it was the winter of 2020, but um, it helped me tremendously coming back into my faith because I was a little lost on how to pray and do meditation. My brain never shuts off. So <laughs> um, it was tremendously helpful. So yeah, no, that's awesome. I just thought that was so cool. Um, but yeah, I guess just kind of hopping into our topic here. Basically, I guess we're right now, we're in the day and age where almost anything is accessible. At the tips of our fingers, we just push a button on our phones and we get, you know, literally anything from boots to clothes to food to entertainment. We have the world at our fingers. But good literature is almost completely gone from society, at least from what I've seen. You know, the entertainment we have today is really gruesome or borderline pornographic, if not actually pornographic. Because when I was younger, I was raised on things like Little House on the Prairie and audiobooks like Peter Pan. And then we also listened to music like James Taylor. But now we have Euphoria, Fifty Shades of Grey, and Lizzo. So as Catholics, like we really have a duty to protect ourselves, you know, our hearts and our minds from a lot of the filth that society tries to shove down our throats. But you know, from your experience being, you know, a priest and things like this, how can we do this? Like, how can we protect ourselves, especially with the tremendous peer pressure that young adults are facing these days and without coming off as like prudish or, you know, that Christian stereotype where we're like, we can't do that, you know, kind of thing. What's your experience with that? Yeah. You know, this is a a really tough question. And this is one that I, I think we examine, and I, I wrote a piece about this probably like 10 years ago when I first started online writing and blogging, but it was just kind of, I had to reconcile my own faith with the fact of some of the things that I was watching on TV, because I love television, I love movies, I, I do a lot of work with entertainment and Hollywood uh, in terms of movie reviews for different companies and such, so it, it is a passion of mine, and so there's this this reconciliation, I guess, that has to take place, or you sometimes, sometimes I have to say, no, I don't think I want to sign on to this project. But uh, even in some of our television shows today, it's like they they have to shove these things really uh, in into our face, right? So it, it's right there. Like uh, w- one show, you know, that I, I used to love, uh, it's a crime show for, for whatever that means, but uh, what would happen is, you know, there's this character and you didn't know much about the character. The show ended, but now they did a reboot. And so now they brought this character back as, you know, your token lesbian in the show. And so it's like, do you really need to put that in front of us? Is this really something that we need to see? And, you know, I think modern wise, uh, just recently, we we saw this happen with Candace Cameron Bure, uh, you know, from Full House and Fuller House. Uh, she loves Christmas movies. She starred in a lot of them. She writes them for her entertainment company, Candy Rock. She produces them. But she made this statement of why I left Hollywood or why I left Hallmark, rather. And she said, I left Hallmark because it wasn't something that my faith could allow me to stay with because I didn't like some of the storylines. I didn't like that it was contradicting what I believe in. And so she took a lot of flack for that. Uh, There was one uh, person from Full House that said, I will never talk to you again because of what you said about, you know, about traditional marriage and that you're for it and that you, you know, disregard whatever, right? The, the, The LGBTQ plus whatever. And so I think she's a great example of one who has lived this and who is facing this. But she said, no, my conscience says I can't do this. And 
So maybe to some, it was prudish. They thought that was the case, but she's sticking with what she believes in. So I think that if you can articulate why you believe something and be able to defend your position, well, then you're not prudish at all. You know, I, I like the chosen. I know some people don't like the chosen. It's controversial, especially in Catholic circles. But I wrote a piece uh, about season three, episodes one and two, and I, I had the chance to pre-screen it before it was in theaters. And one of the things that I was taken aback by was kind of the over sexual desires of St. Peter for his wife, you know, and I get it. Peter was married. And so he, you know, they would have had marital relations, but it was just one of those subplots within a storyline that I'm like, I don't think I personally need to see that. You know, it's not something I've ever thought about with St. Peter, the marital relationship of, with he and his wife, but it was just one of those things where it's like, even there you have a Christian product and it's, kind of putting the sexualized ethos uh, in front of you. No, absolutely. I definitely noticed that too. I was just like, this feels a little out of place in The Chosen. I've only gotten through season one. I, I haven't watched season two, but that was definitely something I noticed as well, where even Christian movies can't, can't get away from it. And there was that new movie that just came out, you know, with um, uh, Father Stu you know yeah, and that was controversial as well because there were so many f bombs and even though i understand they're trying to make it as accurate to father stew as possible because he was a gangster and like he was into drugs and had a bad childhood i don't feel like cursing does much to help with you know driving in the fact that like oh he had a bad childhood or this or that especially the amount of it I was glad that they didn't show any of the sex scenes or anything like that, um, but it was but still- It was the sexual encounter that he had with this girl in that movie, right? The the one that he was dating before he decided to be a priest. And so they did have that kind of there, right there as a subtle, uh, a subtle storyline, even though. Exactly. And it's like, they don't show it, but at the same time, it was still kind of like, I understand if it was close to his story, right? But at the same time, I do believe that we don't need to put an F-bomb every like five seconds. And that's why I'm a little worried about that new movie coming out about Padre Pio with Shia LaBeouf is because people have said that there's apparently a lot of F-bombs in that movie as well. Mm. Yeah, I've heard that as well. Yeah, I can't judge it, I guess, yet because I haven't personally seen it or anything like that. But I know that to be true. And there was... There was a movie, and I wrote this piece back for LTA. I just pulled it out back in uh, 2018. And I went and I saw this movie called The Post. It had Meryl Streep and Tom Hanks in it. I saw it in theaters. And one of the things that just left me unsettled was like all the times that, you know, that, that they would take God's name in vain, that they would say Jesus, that they would say GD or whatever. And it was just one of those things that it was like, this isn't necessary. You could create a movie without all of this content. And the same is true for Father Stu, as you mentioned. And kind of the ironic thing is, is now they're releasing a PG-13 version where they've cut out the F-bombs. And so there's kind of a censored version of Father Stu that is being re-released right now. So they even acknowledge it to a certain degree and uh, now are taking some corrective action on that. Oh, I didn't even know that. That's good because I'll watch it again if it's PG. <laughs> yeah, and isn't that an interesting thing too? Because there's like this platform and I don't subscribe to it or anything like that, but Pure Flix is something that they pride themselves on is that they, you know, take out the sex scenes or they take out the 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 cursing or whatever. And so, you know, Pure Flix. So, so it's kind of taking uh, movies of today and making them, safe for people to watch according to their moral compass right no that's interesting I think that's really helpful especially for Christians that don't want these things like shoved in their face you know and I'm not saying that like like cursing in general like that that whole thing like it's something that I really had to overcome because a curse is the opposite of a blessing if anything I don't think cursing um is really necessary. I don't think it's necessary to get your point across. I don't think it's necessary for jokes or movies or music. I don't think cursing is something that is necessary in language. Um, 
I think we can tell people we're upset with them without, you know, an F you or, you know, something else. It's just one of those, I feel like it's a cop out for communication almost, you know, we're using bad language as almost being like, I'm upset with you and I'm going to show you how, but I'm not going to explain why or something like that. You know, it's like a quick, like, I don't like you type thing instead of actually like solving the problem or talking it out. Now, if you're in a car and somebody cuts you off, you can't really talk to that person, but Um, it's just interesting to me how some people will use, uh, foul language as like a cop-out instead of actually communicating. Um, but like we're talking about these types of movies and things like this, why is the literature we consume so important, especially in our faith life as Christians? Yeah, there's a quote from Jesus in the gospels that is just one that I think, um, speaks to this. Jesus says that from the fullness of the heart, the mouth speaks. So from our heart, we're going to say whatever it is. So if we surround, it's kind of like this principle that if we surround ourselves with very good people, wholesome people, and these are the people we spend our time with, well, that's going to impact who I am as a person. And when I'm not with them, even that influence they have is still going to be seen in my life. Now, if you surround yourself with a bunch of bad people and, and you know who have lots of vices or whatever, well, then that's also going to impact you and you're going to maybe act a different way when you're with them. So from the fullness of the heart, the mouth speaks. So if I'm watching good and wholesome television or if I'm reading good books, well, my heart is going to be filled with good things. And so then that's going to dictate what I say, what I do, how I act. You know, if you're watching shows that degrade women, for example, or reading books that degrade sexuality or whatever, uh, well, then the how you look at the other person is going to be affected for a man or for a woman, for that matter. They're from the fullness of the heart. So if I'm reading stuff like that or watching stuff, well, then I'm going to notice there's going to be a greater lust in my life, a lust for other people. Uh, I'm going to covet them maybe. And so I really do think that it impacts our actions and, and our words and, and thoughts and everything like that. I completely agree. And I think it's interesting too, because, you know, they always say you are what you eat. Well, you are what you consume as well and who you hang around. You know, the more you hang around uh, people who smoke, drink and have sex outside of marriage, the more likely you probably are to do those things because it's influential. But if you're hanging out around good, pious Catholic people, then they're going to lead you down the, the, the narrow path. Yeah, definitely. So you want to have holy friends. That's what I think it comes down to. You know, the the goal of this life on earth is the kingdom of heaven. And so if you have people in your life that are leading you away from the kingdom of heaven, then you need to detach. You know, it's it's like what Jesus says, cut off the arm, throw it, throw it away, because it's better that you lose one arm than to suffer forever in Gehenna. So uh, I, I think that's true for our relationships as well. So find the people that are going to make you a saint. Right. And that can be really difficult, especially in today's society, finding Catholics that aren't just Catholic in church, but also out of church. That's something that I struggled with a ton coming back into my faith because I would meet people in church and I'm like, wow, these people are great. And the next minute they're getting drunk with their best friend, like over the weekend. And I'd be like, does Catholicism stay in the church? Are we only Catholic when we walk through the church doors? Like, And it can be disheartening being a young adult and seeing that so many other young adults do not have the same passion or drive for their faith. Um, And I think a lot of that just comes from, I think my generation, especially, uh, we don't really have a lot of drive. Like we're just kind of willing to go with the flow and not really work on ourselves because it's easier to follow the world than it is to follow Christ. We know that because following Christ involves suffering, but suffering isn't bad. Learning how to suffer well can really impact us in the future for the better. Yeah. And, you know, going back to kind of the anecdote that you shared about like, okay, so are they just a Catholic at church? They don't allow that to impact their life. I think one of the things we need to realize too is we're all in the process of conversion. And so for some of us, we've reached that point a lot quicker than others. And so I guess it's up to us to pray for them so that they might realize, well, yeah, you know, I need to change my life. I need to align it more to gospel values and the teaching of the church and and things of that nature. 
No, that's a great point too. I think it's, I think it's that common idea. Like, are you praying or are you complaining? You know, if you're complaining about certain things, you're probably not praying enough then. Yeah, definitely. And, and sometimes you can bring those complaints of yours to prayer because even the Psalm says, you know, something to the effect of like, you know, God, you hear me when I complain. And so, so God does receive that. And then, but then we have to let it go. So as we complain, we're saying, I, I submit this, I surrender this to you, God, and now do with, do with me as you want. That's really what we should be praying all the time. Right. I'm sure God gets tired of me venting, but you know, he doesn't because he's God. So <laughs> it's fine. Um, a common question. I actually get quite a lot from like young adults, like younger than me, like teens and young adults is how do we determine if a specific show song or movie is sinful? Because it can be really hard to determine that. Yeah. I, I love the confitier at mass that we say, I confess to almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters that I've greatly sinned in my thoughts, in my words, in what I've done and what I have failed to do. And so I think that you can take a little element of the confidior there and maybe apply that, you know, so how is this show, how is this song, how is this movie affecting my thoughts? So does it move me to think of godly thoughts? Does it move me to think of evil thoughts? Does this show that I watch, does it make me want to self-harm, you know? There, there was that show on Netflix, like 13 Reasons Why. And I think that that show increased teenage suicide as people watch this kid. And so you, you have to say, well, what is this show doing for my thoughts? And, and what did it do? Well, it, it led others to think of that and to perceive that as something that was possible or something that they were capable of. So um, I think our thoughts, you know, again, our words, like how does it make me talk or what? how does it make me act? You know, you could watch a show and it could potentially lead you to do sinful actions. Uh, I think you could even say this with the news, for example. If if all you do is you watch, you know, CNN or Fox News or whatever news outlet it is, and all it does is make you cuss and swear, well, maybe that's something you need to root out of your life. Or if you listen to talk radio and all it does is it makes you angry, well, those are emotions. And so that that's evoking something within us. So there, there is that examination that needs to be done. I think too, you could do the examination maybe even on behalf of the characters of the show because every all, all of these shows these days, these couples aren't married. They're having sexual relations. They show them in the bed together. You don't see the action, but the, the perception is there. And you know that's something that, that I actually have to write sometimes in these reviews that I do that I have to say like, there's an unnecessary sexual encounter in this show. So this is true. There's a new show on Netflix called The Wonder. And uh, it's about, um, it, it's set in Ireland in 1862. It's a girl named Anna. She hasn't eaten for months. And so they bring in a religious sister and they bring in a nurse who observes this Anna. And, uh, and so they want to see if she's eating, if this is really true, if it's a miracle or if it's a fraud. And uh, but the, the nurse, who's not the nun, you know, has this unnecessary sexual experience in the in the show. So, you know, you, you do that examination. So and say, well, what what does this mean for this person, you know, and for their eternal salvation if they were real? Right. And and, and I guess. Some you you have to make that decision whether or not where where kind of the line is drawn. Like, you, do do you watch nothing with that type of content? Is it okay if it's just very minimal? You know, so yeah, there, there's a big difference I think between like Game of Thrones, which when that came out, and I've never seen an episode, but I I remember a Catholic commentator defending Game of Thrones to his or her dying breath, right, and. Uh, and, and it just seemed like it was probably more pornographic in nature. And uh, and so, you know, that's kind of an extreme, whereas maybe another show is a lesser extreme. But I don't know where you draw the line. This is this is a very difficult question to answer. I also think it depends on like the person, like what triggers you, you yeah. know, like are there certain things that are going to lead you to sin? Because I don't. I don't think it's like a one picks all situation. You kind of have to discern for yourself. Is this 
leading me towards Christ or is this not? Does this affect me in a negative way or is it just purely entertainment and I can view it as that? Um, Because that can be really difficult. I used to watch The Vampire Diaries and I was like obsessed with just everything in it. And it got to such an unhealthy obsession that if I wasn't exactly like one of the characters on there, I didn't want to be alive type thing. It was really bad. Um, And also I think it desensitizes us too, if we're not careful, like what you were saying about, like, maybe they don't show the actions of having a sexual scene, but it, it kind of initiates that something's going to happen or is happening. And it desensitizes us to like the cursing and the sex scenes and those types of things. Well, that's exactly what you know, the media industry wants to do. That's why they have the transgender person in the show. That's why they have a lesbian couple. It's why they show these things is because they want to normalize it as a part of society. And legally, in a sense, if we talk politically, the, the world has done that. We have normalized these things that our scriptures tell us are not normal, that go against the moral code. And so we as a church then, and we as Catholics, we're standing up. You know, uh, unfortunately, there, there, there are some priests or bishops that don't stand up to some of this immorality that is happening. But for the most part, the, the church is always standing up against these moral issues and saying this isn't right. And, and, and then you have other churches, you know, those that have broken off uh, through, the Ref- through the Reformation or, or whatever that endorse a, and kind of give license to, to some of these sins. So, um, yeah, the church is there as kind of our moral compass and as our voice uh, to help us to, to know and to uh, really kind of say this isn't normal and uh, try to find normalcy then within the confines of the church. Um, I was going to say it definitely depends, too, because sometimes the media, from what I know, at least, is Hollywood is very anti-God, anti-Christian for the most part. And so I noticed that they'll sneak in GDs and like taking the Lord's name in vain and Jesus and all these things into their movies. And maybe it's not a lot at first, but then as you get older as an adult and you get into more adult movies, it happens so much more often. And so literature can really change the way that we talk, speak, and act, but it can also change the way we we think and act around church and God and the way we view God. Um, so I know literature can change the way that we view God, but do you have any experience in that with how literature kind of can warp God? Yeah, I would suppose if you continue to be saturated and kind of some of the evil and vileness that some of the media can bring to bring forward that it could make you uh it, it could make you go astray it can make you begin to question and and seeing certain things um can can make you question well is the church really right and and so i think that it could bring about this questioning of god the authority of the church things of that but i think too uh not only can it you know do this bad but maybe maybe you see it and you react so if this is bad media we're consuming that we shouldn't be consuming, but maybe the reaction to that is saying, no, this is bad, and I want something that's opposite. You know, it's kind of like uh, <laughs> the Marian theologian brings Mary in, but it, it, it's like Mary. So she is um, she is the the epitome of virtue, right? So she she's without sin, she has no inclination to sin. And so when I look at Mary, well, I want what she has. I I want to be who she is. And so I think sometimes we can look at something and say, well, I want the opposite of that then. So if I'm looking at television and it's a bad show, I'm reading bad books, well, maybe it creates a hunger of saying, I want God now. There's emptiness, and now I think God is the only thing that can fill it. I've tried to fill it with with Hollywood and everything like that, and it isn't working. And, And maybe even if you're watching a show and it's a character, maybe you're walking with that character, and that character then kind of brings about some sort of thought process in your own mind, maybe bringing you to God. So I think, yes, it can lead us away from God. That's for sure. Change our perception of God. But maybe 
maybe for the good, it can bring us back to him as well. That's definitely an interesting perspective, too, because I know coming back into my faith, that's basically what I did. You know, I went to Hollywood, I went to secular society for answers and to fill the hole that was in my heart. And yet nothing could do that. And eventually um, it basically forced me to go back to mass to find something, to feel something after eight years. And that's where I found contentment and and um, true peace, I guess, is the right word. And so it's interesting how literature can do that. Um, it's just crazy to me how people's worldview really plays into that and how they were raised and how they view God, because it's not just the literature they consume, but it's also family and, you know, their childhood and their upbringing and what school they went to and what they learned and how they process information and things like that. I know today, especially with the younger generations, they, I mean, we've always kind of had this issue of younger generations disrespecting older generations. Like that's nothing new, but I definitely know that today, younger generations are growing up so, so fast. And especially those kids who are in public school and things like that, they don't respect um, authoritative figures because, well, let's be honest, the school system's not the best here. And so how can we teach and communicate to these younger generations about protecting their integrity in their hearts without coming off as like judgmental and being like, no, you can't do this at all. Um, because, you know, retaliation is just something that happens in kids. You know, they want to go against the grain a little bit and be different. Um, how can we communicate to them that it is important without being super judgmental towards them? Yeah, so uh, I think for young people, uh, and like, I, I think we have to talk about forming young people from a very young age, and some families do a very good job at this, um, controlling what their children consume and the media. But we also just see it today, too, that it's much easier to put a phone or a tablet in front of a child's face to keep them entertained than to deal with a situation. And so I, I so for, for the young person, it, it's important to kind of bring them up with, with a good, wholesome uh, view of, of media and what they watch and everything like that. Um, and they need to know, I, so you can't live under a rock. Like if you go out in the world, you're going to meet a transgendered person. You're going to see, uh, you're going to see two men holding hands. You're going to, you're going to encounter the craziness of the world. So you can't live under a rock. You have to know about these things, but that, but we need to somehow protect them, uh, uh, protect them from that in a sense, right? And then to, they don't need to embrace it. They don't need to live that lifestyle that, so how do you do it for the young person at, who, who's experiencing all this? It's a great question. Um, I, I think it's helping them to understand, you know, the different realities of our time. Like, why is it that these things are not the best? And so if we can kind of teach them and help them understand and bring them to a point where they own these things, well, then that's going to impact their own decisions and how they view everything else uh, from media to the world and everything in between. I agree. I think it can definitely be difficult as well because you know, I'm a babysitter, so I babysit for a lot of different families. And um, for a family who I watch who have two kids, the the one thing that I always notice is that um, they kind of get, I guess, helicopter parenting, kind of. Like, the kids aren't allowed to know about anything horrible that's going on in the world right now. Um, and the kids are older now. Obviously, I think there's age appropriate ways of communicating to these children about the horrors of the world that's going on. But at the same time, kids are not stupid. And I think a lot of times um, we shelter the kids almost too much. And then when they get into these real world you know, situations and they see these things, it's almost like a culture shock to them and they don't know how to react. And it kind of causes this retaliation, almost like a rebellious side. Um, Cause that's what happened to me and not like to the, to an extent. Um, my parents never really hid anything from us, but 
I definitely knew like going out to the world after being homeschooled and things like that was definitely a culture shock, especially in like theater and orchestra and stuff like that, experiencing those things. Yeah. And I've seen this too. You, you mentioned the word retaliation and sometimes if you're to, uh, you know, using your word of helicoptering, then a child is going to reject these things. And I, I saw this actually in, in a, a guy that I went to seminary with. He was homeschooled. He, his family was very devout. They prayed the rosary every day. But all throughout his seminary experience, and I went to school with him for six years, he struggled with the rosary because of his childhood. And, you know, I, I believe in family rosaries. Don't, don't get me wrong. But I see even just in a religious sense how that has happened. But then you see that too, then, you know, kind of the, the conservative family and then the child kind of rebels and becomes like the super liberal kid and, and kind of to, to the dismay of his parents and, and just tries to do anything to upset his parents in that regard. And they become a person that maybe they're not even that they aren't, you know? So, um, yeah, it, it's these are crazy times we live in. That is for sure. I agree. And I think it's really difficult for the younger generation, because like you said, there are iPads and phones being pushed in their faces at such young, such young ages. And they're learning about all these social media app platforms, such as TikTok and, and things. And I think a lot of the times that's where they get these ideas from, because it sounds like a good idea. You know, it's easier to go along with what the world says. Um, And so it's very interesting to kind of experience that and coming back to like the entertainment thing. Um, I'm always wondering, is it possible to become too scrupulous about the entertainment we consume? Because I know at some point I used to be really scrupulous before I started spiritual direction. And it was almost like I couldn't watch any TV or any show or any music or anything because it always had something in it that seemed, you know, to be against Catholicism or to be too worldly. Yeah, so I would say that for something to be a sin, and and we know this in terms of mortal sin, like you have to know it's a sin, it has to be serious, and you you have to commit the sin and do it willfully, with you know, with full knowledge. And so, I, I think a lot of times the the passiveness of television or media or whatever is that maybe it doesn't cause us a sin. Uh, because we we have to commit the action of sin then uh it has to lead to something of course there are the sins in our thoughts so so that would be one example of a sin that that can emerge from television so um can can you be too scrupulous yeah you i i suppose you can be in the sense of maybe you just renounce it altogether and say i can't watch television because there's nothing good on television well i even in some of these things that we watch, I still believe that there's good things that you can extract from them. Like on Netflix right now, there's a movie called The Noel Diaries, and it's a Christmas movie, okay? It's kind of like in the vein of Christmas movies where it's like, you know, they fall in love and then they there's a wedge that drives them away and then they come back and embrace or whatever. But, but there's like something underneath it too. Like it was so different than watching like a Hallmark movie or Great America Channel or whatever, in that there, there was another subplot underneath it. And it was this discovery, the search for truth. And, and um, for, for the one person, he was searching uh, to find healing, really, because he had a terrible family upbringing. He was estranged from his father. His mother just died. His brother died when he was a kid. So he was really in search of healing. This other character who he falls in love with uh, she is searching for her birth mother. And so the diary he finds in his mother's home tells the story of her birth mother that gives her up for adoption, but she was abandoned by her family. And, and you know, she wasn't welcome because she was an unwed mother. And, and so, you know, I think there's something underneath there that, that you could say, well, this is really telling us as pro-life people, we need to support a, a, a mother that a family shouldn't abandon a mother. And now the, the movie set, that person was a different time, but it's just a good reminder. But you could look at that movie and say, oh, there was that unnecessary sexual scene. And you could say, I'm not going to watch that movie. But then you're going to miss something else that you could take away from it. So um, 
in terms of the sinfulness, if it's overtly sinful, you will know. You know, if if everything is innuendo after innuendo, you should turn it off. If there's a story there, well, this is the story of civilization. This is the story of people's lives, and 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 they're messy, and and maybe sometimes that's something that it's okay then, it's permissible uh, perhaps to watch. So uh, you can be too scrupulous, um, but I, you, you have to let your conscience dictate that. And, and if there is something there that you think is sinful, well, you can confess that. You can say, I watched things on television I shouldn't have, or I didn't fast forward through a scene. I've heard those things before. And, and I don't think that's scrupulous. That's an awareness of I know that these acts, if I commit them, are sinful, and so I shouldn't be watching them myself. Right. No, I completely agree. And I know there were so many um, stories and things that I enjoyed, um, like movies and stuff like that. And if there was a sex scene, I would just fast forward it. You know, I would just be like, well, if it's just one. But again, if it was like multiple throughout like an entire like series or movie or something, I'd be like, all right, this is too much. Yeah. Um but for the most part, I mean, like most movies do have sex scenes, but being able to fast forward them is definitely a blessing. Thank goodness for the fast forward button. Yeah. And that's the value of streaming things. It's not live. You know, I guess if it was on television, if you're watching traditional television, you just walk out of the room or something at that point. I, I think in my life, there's probably only been a few, like there's only been a few shows where I said, you know, this really gets to my conscience. And, and, you know, there was a show like Dexter, for example, was one of those shows. It was a serial killer show. I don't know if you, but I've it, heard of it. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was just one of those shows where there came a point after I watched like three or four episodes, I said, I don't think I can watch this anymore. Like mm -hmm. there was something going on inside of me. And, and I think another modern day show, kind of a parallel to Dexter is the show you, Y-O-U, that, you know, there's that funny bit with, Raymond Arorio and Laura Ingram going on like, you know, back and forth about you, the show, but that is a morally depraved show, I think, yeah. personally, as one who watched a few episodes, it was like, I couldn't watch it. And even the Stranger Things, um, I, I think I watched one season of it, but what I heard about the last season, the ser se series finale, was that it was very dark, and a lot of people I know couldn't finish watching it because of the darkness of the show. Right. I've heard that too. And it's interesting how they kind of get you with the first or second season, you know, they hook you in and then they kind of switch the show. And I noticed that a lot as well. It's just unfortunate, but yeah, um, it's just crazy. But as we wrap up here, um, what are some of your favorite literary works personally? What do you like? Yeah, that's a great question. So in terms of books, you know, uh, being a priest, I guess, you know, a lot of religious books come to mind. I, I'm a big fan of what we would call hagiography, which is a fancy word for the stories of the saints. Uh, put a saint story in front of me and I'll eat it up. You know, I just love the, the saints. Um, uh, in terms of, of literature, I, I was a big C.S. Lewis fan, The Chronicles of Narnia. To be honest, I've never gotten into the Lord of the Rings. I want to this next year, maybe get into the Lord of the Rings, but it was just something I didn't grow up with it around me. And I, I just uh, never was able to get into it. Um, so uh, it could be one of those things now with maturation and, and age and everything, maybe I'll be able to do so. In terms of film, I love thrillers. So I like the psychological twist at the end. Uh, those are some of my favorites. Those are always the best. I always like the old thrillers, though, you know, like the Hitchcock um, thrillers and stuff like that. Those were always iconic, a little cheesy, but <laughs> I don't know. I personally liked them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and yes, yeah, so there, there's lots out there, you know, and this is we're living in an age, as we've talked about, you know, with phones and everything like that. But with everything that's available to us, there are people that put out good content and you can find it. And uh, and it's great when you find it and are able to consume it. Absolutely. I agree. And our last question for today is what are you, the favorite books you've written personally? Yeah. So I think I've written eight or nine, seven, or I, I don't know how many. <laughs> uh, so I just wrote this cute little children's book, which is interesting because it, one of the stories in it was published like seven years ago, but it went out of print because the publisher folded and 
And I just really wanted to bring it back. So I hired an illustrator, re it. I chose to self-publish it, but that's called Father Looney's Christmas Story. So uh, I think that, so the, the one story in there is called Breakfast in Bethlehem. It's about an angel that takes a boy to Bethlehem. He sees Christmas unfold and sees all of these different events with different symbolisms. And then his grandpa helps him interpret the dream uh, when he comes over for Christmas dinner. And uh, so it's a cute little story inspired by a little boy I met at an event that I was at who uh, went to see Santa and asked him for a picture of the baby Jesus. And it was the same day that I wrote uh, Breakfast in Bethlehem. And then I had to put another story in there to make page count or whatever. And that was a uh, flowers from the shepherd boy. So the shepherd boy meets the holy family in the fields. Uh, you mentioned uh, my book, How They Love Mary. That's that's the book I dreamed of writing. And it was like the last book I've written in my devotional genre. Uh, it was really hard actually to fight a publisher to publish it, which was, you know, my dream book. And, and uh, I'm happy now, Sophia Institute. They turned it down twice before they took it the third time. So um, third time's but, the charm. Uh, I, I guess. And uh, so How They Love Mary is about 28 people, 28 holy men and women, saints, should be saints, uh, could be saints, you know, uh, and, and just what they wrote about Mary, how they loved Mary, all of that. So uh, if you're looking to deepen your Marian devotion, that would be a good read. Uh, I wrote my very first devotional book was A Heart Like Mary's, and it still continues to be like the best selling book of mine. Uh, people still find it and, and relate to it. But it was really a, a challenge for my spiritual director. And, and I, I know that you live down in the, in the Illinois, Chicagoland area. My spiritual director was a Mariologist named Father Jim Presta, who's in like uh, St. Emily's, maybe in Mount Prospect. And wow. uh, he, said, he said to me, he said, Edward, because I was a Marian, the budding Marian theologian. I mean, I was complaining about something. He's like, where's your Marian heart? And I spent like, months thinking about what it meant to have a heart like Mary's from that one question he posed to me. So uh, a heart like Mary's is a, a goodie. And then if you want to learn about Mary's apparitions and live in applied spirituality of Marian apparitions, a Lenten journey with Mother Mary is a great uh, Lent read uh, in which we I, I just lead people through the different messages, through topics, through each week. So like the first week is examining your conscience. The second week is praying for others. Or the fourth week is, uh, you know, types of prayer that Mary requested in her apparition. So uh, it's just a way to come to know the stories of her apparitions. Absolutely. And I know the How They Loved Mary, that was a book you sent me and it's just fantastic. It almost reminds me of like a Marian consecration sort of, sort of vibe. It gives you a bunch of different stories, how they loved her. Um, things you can reflect on. It was just really lovely, but yeah, no, those books sound great. I think I'm definitely going to look up those other two books you mentioned because that's awesome. But Father Looney, thank you so much for coming on here and discussing literature with me and why it's important in our Christian faith. Yeah, it's been a joy. This is a topic that I really love. And so I was happy for the invitation. Of course. Yes. And I hope to have you back on soon. And where can my listeners find you? Yeah. So, uh, on, on the internet, I think I have a website, edwardlooney.com maybe. And uh, uh, on all the social medias, my handle is at FR Edward Looney. So you, you'll be able to find me on Instagram or Facebook or Twitter. Uh, and I have a YouTube channel, I guess. I, I put out content pretty regularly there as well. So, but I don't know the handle for that. <laughs> That's okay. We'll link it all in the description. But thank you so much again, Father Looney. Um, I hope to have you back on soon. I look forward to it. Awesome. And with all that being said, I hope that you guys enjoyed this episode of A Catholic's Perspective, and we'll be back in a couple weeks. All right. Bye, guys. Thank you so much for listening to A Catholic's Perspective with me, The Religious Hippie. Make sure to visit my official website at thereligioushippie.com, and while you're there, be sure to sign up for my newsletter to keep up to date with my latest news and offerings. You can also find me on virtually any social media site as The Religious Hippie. Thanks for listening! A quest is a search for something. And every week, the Quest podcast will show you how we know what we know, through interviews with people that have incredible stories of dedication and perseverance. I'm your host, Todd Fisher. Join me in this thought-provoking and inspiring podcast of discovery. 
find us anywhere you listen to podcasts. Tis the season to shine with H&M. Discover the holiday collection and find fashionable pieces for your wardrobe or for under the tree. Get inspired and dazzle with this year's glam. From tuxedo styles, bow detailed pieces, impressive prints, and more. From unforgettable looks to unforgettable gifts. With fashion finds to home decor, find it all at H&M. Treat your loved ones and yourself this season. Shop in-store or at hm.com. Thank you for listening to this podcast. Please be sure to rate and review this episode. This podcast is produced by Todd Fisher and Anthony Smith and is distributed by Metacortex Publishing. This podcast is copyright. Any previously trademarked or copyright content is used by permission. Information and opinions stated in this podcast should not be construed as medical advice. Please be sure and visit the official website for Metacortex Publishing at metacortexpublishing.com or find us on social media for other unique content.